Hey, Joe Mastriano, CPA, and welcome to my Live at Five after Christmas and on the IRS. All things IRS this evening. Well, let's look at what these guys have been doing. First, they have collection agencies go after people, three main ones. Then they decide, nah, it's not working out. And then they decide to send them back. In fact, I get more letters now, let's say in the last couple of weeks, from collection agencies that have been assigned my clients than IRS letters actually that are enforcement letters telling people they're going to levy them if they don't pay. So that that's that. Now, looking at the... Um, automated collections, they're still not going after people. You can get away with murder, unfortunately. Uh, slows down my business. But I'm always going to be perfectly honest with everybody, as I've always been since day one. And right now, if your case is at automated collections, and you've pulled your transcripts and you know exactly overall in your situation what's going on, then you you still have a free ride. Now, it should change in January, probably won't change till February, um, but I will take the opportunity now to tell everybody that um, people make too many assumptions. Because I said, if you pulled your transcripts and you know the situation, well, most people don't. I have clients, they come here with their transcripts, but they can't read them. They don't know, you know, the effectiveness of them. Um, for example, I had a client recently that they pulled their own transcripts. They sent in, a, a, what do you call it, an amended return. Couldn't tell what was going on. I called the IRS and found out that they posted the amended return. The only problem was they waited so long that the interest and penalties on the liability that was the actual liability left over after the adjustment from the amended return was more than the amendment. Let me give you an example. Let's say the liability was 50 grand. The amendment was to save them five, knock it down to 45. They waited so long that the, the 50 grand became 60. And then when you take the five off, it's 55. So they wound up paying more anyway because of interest and penalties. Don't you just love the IRS? And so what else can I say? Audits. Some of the stuff that you hear politically is correct. Um, not only are they hiring people to go after you, they've already been hiring people, but the audit division takes a lot of liberties and the audit division, um, there, some of them don't even accept what for many years has been absolute proof to defend the taxpayer's position, either on expenses or on income that they try to charge you with. So if you get audited, what happens is they go to your personal bank account and they say, prove that that deposit, you know, that um, thousand dollar present your grandmother gave you on your birthday. Um, I, I think I'm going to charge that for interest. Oh, you don't have anything to document what it was for. Tough luck on you. About 10 years ago, I came up with a four part checklist that has to do with pulling transcripts, matching the information, and filing a paper return because you can't attach attachments to the return when you e-file. And those attachments can explain your position and prevent an audit. So my four-part checklist, whenever they we use it for the current year's return, there's not one person I know that was ever audited, which is pretty good track record. Now, part of that is to 
make sure you pay your taxes, but you file by the extension date, right before the extension date, right before October 15th. Why? Because most returns have been selected for audit already. And they're not likely to add more to it. They might, but they're not likely to. Most audits get selected between April and let's say July or August. Of course, that can change, but that, that's been the history. And of course, if you add to that um, matching up the information item by item that the IRS has, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I've worked for CPA firms before I started my own. And to this day, I've watched what other CPA firms have done. And it really didn't matter if it was a CPA firm or a law firm or a tax uh, representation company. People combine 1099s on the self-employed individual and they put the, the on, on the Schedule C, they put the gross income down. Well, if you have clients that file, um, you know, their vendors file 1099s, the IRS doesn't know if you included all the 1099s or have any idea what your other income was. So if they go to the bank, and which they do, and they pull your uh, bank statements, the bank, so, you know, forget privacy, the, the banks will give it to them. And if they have no idea and those numbers are high enough, or even if they're low, they'll audit you. But if you have, let's say, three 1099s, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, and you list them and say the balance that I wasn't 1099 was another 20,000, and they look at the deposits in your account and they see that it matches you may not get audited unless, of course, you did something else wrong. So it, it's critically important that you avoid an audit because they go to the current year, the prior year, and the year after. I, I'll never forget that time an auditor told me, yeah, Joe, even though you filed an extension for your client and it's not up for another seven months, I'm going to sit on this audit till the seven months are up. And then when your client files the tax return, I'll audit that return too. So they have their tricks up their sleeve. And I always, you know, laugh at people who think they can deal with the IRS rather than recognizing that it's a specialty. I have dozens of clients that are attorneys. I have CPAs that I've represented in audits. Um, you know, I can read a manual and learn how to fix my car too, but there's certain things I'm not going to know and a lot that I don't want to know. And why bother? Why not get the return incorrect in the first place and avoid an audit? Now, if you're audited, that's where I come to help. In fact, probably half my audit representation come from people who have tried on their own or had their tax preparer try to help them. And I have to laugh at that, too, because if you don't understand what the IRS accepts as evidence in each area, you know, expenses and income, um, then what's going to happen is you're going to lose and they're going to come up with something and they're going to bluff you also. And then you're going to realize certain deadlines passed and you can get in trouble with that as well. You know, there's three main areas you can appeal. You can appeal an offer and compromise. You can appeal an audit. You can appeal a collection issue. And in the last few years, the quality of the IRS as a body, as an agency, has gone down tremendously. And I have a lot of sympathy for them. I don't join the group of people who put them down and everything because, you know, they have a job to do and they have advisors, uh, managers above them. And those managers have managers above them. And they don't operate like a profitable business. They got 
they get pulled out in different directions by other government agencies. And so uh, there's a lot of revenue officers I talk to or agents and their hands are tied very often. And the ones that really want to do their jobs get very frustrated. And I, I totally understand that. It's unfortunate though that tax payers uh, often pay the price for that. So again, when somebody, you know, I was going to say when somebody's tax preparer tries to help them, they often fail. But what I want to say is over the years, I get many, many tax preparers that come to me. In fact, I've got about three or four cases now that are brought to me by preparers. And two of them are the preparers themselves who have come to me for help in their own audit because there's a lot of people that prepare tax returns that have no idea what the IRS requires as evidence in an audit and they don't care. They do returns anyway and their clients don't understand that either. They, they say, well, you know, I have to do a tax return and how much is it going to cost and how much is my refund going to be and could I get rapid refund or refund advantage or whatever it's called? Uh, they change it every so often. And that's what they care about. And if you say to the preparer, will I get audited? They're like, no, no, you got your receipts, right? You got your canceled check, right? They don't even know that it takes more than the receipts and canceled checks to prove deductions. So this uh, video might sound kind of boring to people that aren't technical, but I want people to understand more and more uh, what you're up against um, when you deal with the IRS. They've screwed up a lot of transcripts, uh, business transcripts. I've got a few clients, not many, that have business transcripts that were messed up and we'll, we'll get them straightened out. But what if you don't have somebody like me to help you straighten out those transcripts? You're gonna get browbeaten by the IRS. Ah, oh, there's a doctor in New York I talked to a couple of weeks ago and I almost had him as a client, but he just wanted to send in, you know, I think he owed 135,000. He just wanted to send them a check. And I told them, no, we need to pull the transcripts. They may be after you for more money. Maybe they miscalculated. Don't just blindly uh, think that the IRS is correct when they send you a letter. And, and he, nope, he, he backed out at the last minute. And I hope everything's okay. I sent him an email to, asking him to send clients to me that he knows, you know, have IRS problems and that I'm there for him when he needs me. Um, that That's how I do get clients uh, as it comes up. I've been doing this since 1980 when I was 25. And there's a lot of people that know about me and when they get in trouble, uh, I've, again, I've had several clients that um, either they did their own IRS representation or they hired somebody and it didn't work they got in trouble and now they're hiring me and that's what's really interesting it's very deceptive you can read a book on irs representation and think you know what to do oh i'll just call the irs i'll pull my transcripts i'll bounce the money i owe them I mean, what can be so hard and on the surface it kind of looks like that and there's a certain number of people that that's the extent of it, but not the vast majority. And so the vast majority needs some level of help. And that's where I come in. I, I do consultations. And in those consultations, I could explain whatever you wanted to. I've helped a lot of people do their own IRS cases. At some point, I'm going to put a product together. I've already done most of the videos on it. Um, 
because I believe that, you know, people shouldn't pay. I've got competitors. They'll charge four five to 10 grand on a simple case. And they're not doing it themselves. The CPA or attorney isn't doing the case. Um, they're handing it to unlicensed people who gather information. They treat it like it's an administrative function. They fill out forms. They give it to the licensed professional who makes a quick phone call or signs off on it and sends it to the IRS. Um, that's not what you're paying many thousands of dollars for. You want the professional licensed person to be working your case, whether it's an enrolled agent, a CPA or an attorney. Hopefully you hire someone that has a lot of experience like I do. And that person is the one working the case. I mean, I fought that for years. I could have gotten a lot bigger than I am, but I did not. I wanted to keep my license and I wanted to be keep my reputation. And I didn't want to have, uh, you know, uh, complaints all over the place. As it is, there's always a few people that complain anyway. I've had complaints. Um, well, I called the firm yesterday and, you know, it's now a day and a half and they haven't called me back. Or um, I asked someone a question and they didn't have the right answer. Or I, I talked to my attorney and my attorney said that you're wrong and, and, and he's an attorney and you're just a CPA, so he should know better than you. Uh, it's just amazing how some people think sometimes. Um, but the attorneys and the large law firm attorneys that are clients of mine understand that this is a specialty and it requires uh, a high level of experience. So I can go on and on and on, but the purpose of this is to let people know that the IRS is still in pretty bad shape. And I mean, I have cases, innocent spouse cases, offering compromise cases, uh, audit appeal cases, uh, collection appeal cases, that eventually most of it goes my way. But man, the hoops you have to jump through to even get to the right people who want to work the case is kind of crazy. I have a recent offer uh, based on doubt as to liability. And they turned it down saying that the person was a tax matters partner, so they couldn't get him out of it. But they never really read and understood the offer because the person was a tax matters partner in the past, not during the time that he was supposed to be liable for. And that's the only time that counts. Um, but they're going to do that anyway. And then they say, hey, if you want to resubmit it, you know, here's the way to resubmit it, which, which cracks me up because if, if it's denied, then it's denied. Don't tell them here's how you need to change the story and change the facts to, to get it. But we're going to do it and I'm going to fight it. And that's what I'm known to do. I'm a guy who will hang in there and not be bluffed by the IRS or any uh, members of the IRS or even the DOJ's office or anything like that that gets involved. Um, I've done thousands of cases since 1980. Um, that, that's it. So my message is, you know, hire me or hire somebody with my level of experience Make sure the one they're the ones doing the cases. And most of my cases just run a few thousand dollars. You know, if someone's going to charge you 10 grand, boy, they better be doing, you know, a, a couple of different cases, a collection case and an offer and compromise or a collection case and a, an appeal for that matter. Most IRS cases just run two to five grand. They don't run, you know, 10 or 15 grand unless they're doing something special. You know, we've kept our rates for years at just 195 an hour. Um, should you pay 350 an hour? I don't know. 
you know, it depends what your choices are. You know, if you talk to someone else charging 350 and me charging 195, obviously I'm going to say, go with me. But if you don't have somebody and that's your only choice, I would say pay more money rather than trying to wing it yourself. Just make sure you have a good contract agreement and they're going to, um, you know, guarantee certain things. You can't guarantee results, but they can guarantee who's working on the case. They can guarantee that they're not going to, you know, overbill you. Um, you know, there's certain things that can be guaranteed in a business relationship that are not the actual results. Anyway, as always, you can go to JoeMastriano.com and click on the blue button and fill out the contact form. Or you can call Stephanie directly, 713-774-4467. And while you're at JoeMastriano.com, if you click on the green button, you can learn to earn quick $2,000 commissions like I have um, in my venture into affiliate marketing. Thank you. I am signing off. Ooh.